Survivor Series War Games is done, and oh boy, do we ever have a lot to talk about. Both War Games matches were actually incredible, in my opinion. We have a new United States Champion in Shinsuke Nakamura, and Conman's doing this in one take, so it is what it is. We're live over on twitch.tv slash conman167 right after Survivor Series War Games, and my chat was popping off all night. You guys were going insane, but the one thing that seemed to be the common theme here with the chat and throughout the night was that we didn't really love the Vancouver crowd. Now, I don't know what's going on, Vancouver. I don't know what's going on Canada-wide, but this year, the Canadian crowds have not been it, man. I don't get what's going on right now. I don't get why we're sitting on our hands, why half the crowd has, like, one hand in the air for the yeets. Like, what are we doing? Why are we not yeeting all over the place with Jey Uso in Vancouver? People are out here saying that Vancouver deserves a WrestleMania. Nah, nah! Not after that, man. You guys needed to be louder. But obviously the crowd doesn't make or break the show and it's actually the matches that matter so let's kick things off with the very first war games match that was team Rhea Ripley up against team Liv Morgan and this actually shocked me okay because going into this match I actually thought that we were going to see some sort of like focus on the champions not necessarily the babyface team I thought that the champions were going to be the ones standing tall like on one side we had Tiffany Stratton miss money in the bank Nia Jax, the women's uh, heavyweight champion or world champion, my goodness, what is it? WWE Undisputed Champion, there we go, like I said, one take. And then we got the women's world champion as well in Liv Morgan. So like, it seemed weird that we were going to see them take the L when you had all the champions on one side, but that is exactly what happened. It was a crazy match though, and I know a lot of people are saying around the same things that it was a slow build to start things off and that it took a long time to get going. But that is every single War Games match, in my opinion. Like, I think every War Games match we've seen through the years has literally been like that as well, where it's the slow build. People for the first, like, 20 minutes are saying that this is too slow. It, it, nothing's happening, blah, 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 blah. And I do think that I have a bit of an answer for that and I don't know if people would love it or hate it or if it would completely change the dynamic but like I felt that Survivor Series is missing that 5v5 elimination style matchup I wonder if war games could be make be made to be more interesting if we had an elimination aspect to it meaning that anybody could be eliminated at any given time that could make the match a little more interesting where you have these scenarios where it could be two on oh it could be three on oh it could be three on one you name it right so i wonder if like that could be something we could add to war games in the future but i also completely understand that it would change the dynamic of the match but as for the actual matchup like crazy spots happened inside of it there was this one moment Moment where EO Sky climbed all the way up to the top of the cage with her trash can in hand that she's always had at the top, and she hit a damn moonsault. Well, at the exact same time, Tiffany Stratton hit a beautiful swanton bomb crashing down to the floor, both at the same time. The cameraman kind of missed it, so like the effect wasn't there as much as it probably could have been, but still a crazy spot seeing EO Sky hit a damn moonsault in a trash can. And then the ending of the match was just poetic AF with Rhea Ripley and Liv Morgan going to work against each other and Rhea Ripley's team escaping with the win after the riptide. I, I honestly, I thought that the match was... It was really well done. And people, again, were all up in arms for the first, like, 15, 20 minutes about it. My chat was on me saying, Con, this is not good. Con, this is boring. Con, this is bleh. But then I told everyone, just, just wait. Just, just wait. It's gonna get there. The main, like, once we get to, like, the main part of the match when everybody's in, it picks up. And, oh, boy, did it ever pick up. Great women's war games match. And, again, every single year, the women seem to crush it. Like, they just absolutely crush it. It doesn't matter which year it is. The Women's War Games match continues to deliver year in, year out. And once again, they delivered. But let's talk about our new United States champion in Shinsuke Nakamura. And my God, this dude looks like a damn Sith Lord out here. The remix of his theme song, the new entrance, the, f the way that they touched it up after SmackDown as well. Another rendition of that theme song. 
I think this is my favorite version of Shinsuke Nakamura since he's come to the main roster. I don't know if it tops what he did in NXT Black and Gold, but that's also to be expected because he came in with all this crazy hype and was pushed to the moon to begin with. I think that this is the coolest character Nakamura has had on the main roster so far, and every way that they presented him made it seem like it would be a stupid decision to have him lose the United States Championship match. Like, if he lost that thing after all that time and effort put into his entrance and his character it would have been a waste and it would have been one more time for Nakamura to fall down the card and just we don't want to see that for him nobody wants to see that for Shinsuke Nakamura so I'm really glad that he got the United States Championship now for LA Knight this is a little bit of a, a tough one because he lost the United States title in like what 10 minutes it was not a hard-fought match, and after all the momentum he built up through the last couple years, it was interesting to see him lose the title so easily. However, I do think this is going to be a good thing for LA Knight in the long run. Either A, he is going to be moved up into the main event scene, or B, he is going to go back after that United States title, and he is going to chase Nakamura and try to capture that title back, and he may eventually win it back. And if that's the case, well, then I think that that's a good one. I think they also have, they have this moment that they can build on with LA Knight because he was kind of blinded on SmackDown, right? So they can lean into that, that LA Knight didn't have the best vision at this event and that, you know, if he's at 100%, things might be different. They could definitely get back to another match there with LA Knight and Shinsuke Nakamura. It's cool to see Nakamura win this title. And hey, if they want to keep the title on him for like two, three, four months, I think you could build him up as a very effective heel, but then maybe call somebody up from NXT like Oba Femi to take the title from him. I don't know who else on the main roster right now would be the right call to take the title from Nakamura unless it's LA Knight. So I would be so down for Oba Femi to be called up and go after Nakamura. But now on to the Intercontinental Championship match. We had Braun Breaker standing tall in this one, defeating Ludwig Kaiser and Sheamus. And what I think think could be considered the in-ring match of the night. This wasn't a lot of like high spots. It wasn't a lot of crazy, crazy moments like War Games was. And I think that those moments steal the show a little bit more than just a regular triple threat match. But from bell to bell, I think this was probably the most sound match on the card today. All three men crushed it. And the women, I just called it the women's division. My God, <laughs> the mid-card division on Monday Night Raw. Good Lord, I'm not going to get away with that in the comments. The women's division. Good God, one take con over here. But the Intercontinental Championship division looks great on Monday Night Raw, and there's lots of people vying for that title that it makes sense that you would want to keep Braun Breaker strong, and you want to have people constantly going up against Braun Breaker, and then he puts them down before eventually somebody takes the title from him. It may be very well Sheamus. It might be Sheamus. It might be Ludwig Kaiser. It might be a Dominic Mysterio for all we know. And I would be kind of down for Dom Dom to take that title. But if we're building up Braun Breaker in a big way to elevate this IC title, to make him be seen as a credible threat for the main event scene, we're doing it right. I was thinking maybe maybe Ludwig Kaiser was going to steal the title here and then we were going to get a feud between Sheamus and Ludwig. And that's how we get the title on Sheamus. But no. Nah, we kept it on Braun Breaker, and it's it's not a bad call. It honestly isn't. Braun Breaker is just an absolute freak out there in the ring, and his spear to Ludwig hopping over top of Sheamus before then spearing Sheamus into the mat and picking up the win as well. What's there to say about this matchup? Incredible, incredible match from three great talent who are building up the mid-card division on Monday Night Raw in such a big way. So shout out to all three. Then we went on to the World Heavyweight title match. And this was one that, personally, I think could have swapped places with the Shinsuke Nakamura LA Knight match. And here's why I say that. It felt like going into the Shinsuke Nakamura LA Knight match that people were tired, right? We're coming right out of war games. We're going right from one epic match into a 10 minute match where the United States title is changing hands. It felt like the fans were, were done. They were, they were dead, honestly. And I'm not seeing that just because it was a bad crowd. I, I think that they were tired. They were gassed after the women's war games match and they had no effort and no energy to put into the next matchup. Like that second slot on any card is a death spot. And it felt like Nakamura and LA Knight were in a death spot there. But if you would have swapped Gunther and, uh, and Damian Priest 
up into that spot right there and they went on second, I think that match was perfect for it because it was such a slow build. The match never took off. It was just a, a ground and pound into the mat that the biggest moment was when Finn Balor came out of nowhere and stomped on Damian Priest. That was the high spot of the match. You could have gone through that entire matchup, that entire thing, and the fans could have been dead for most of it, and I don't think the reaction to the match would be any different than what it was in the, the co-main event spot. Obviously, people are going to say, like, you know, the World Heavyweight Championship should not go on second, and I do agree. You could have probably started off with it if you wanted to. People would have been into it and then rolled into War Games, but... The way the card was put together, this match didn't need the co-main event spot. It probably could have honestly went on third. It could have went on second. Anywhere but fourth. I just don't see... I, I could see it not main eventing. Other than that, it could have belonged anywhere else on the card. I'm rambling here, but if you get what I mean, you, you understand what I mean, right? The crowd would have been quiet for that match, but probably would have been louder for Shinsuke Nakamura winning the United States title. You know, it's a pretty good trade-off. But now for the actual match right here, the World Heavyweight Championship match between Damian and uh, and Gunther. Look, Gunther going into this thing was not confident at all. This guy had no clue what he was doing, all right? He was the scared general. He wasn't the ring general that we all knew and love up to that point. But during this match, Damian Priest's arm got hurt, and that's when Gunther locked in and started going to work on his arm. He constantly attacked it and... By the end of the match, <laughs> Damien Priest's arm was just like jello. He, he could barely move it at all. And that is what led to him passing out. He passed out at the very end. Uh, Gunther retains his world heavyweight title. And he is still the champion. So now moving forward, I don't know where we go with Gunther. I don't know if we're going to go up against Goldberg at some point. I don't know if they plan on having Seth Rollins go against him or something like that. Maybe CM Punk comes out of this. If he's not going to be on Friday Night SmackDown. I just... I don't know where we're going with it, so let me know down in the comments who is next in line for the World Heavyweight Championship. And then it was the main event, the OG Bloodline versus the new Bloodline inside of War Games, and there was so much drama going into this thing. I loved this match, and again, it followed in the footsteps of the other War Games match, where the first, like, 20 minutes were kind of just there, and again, it could possibly be saved by adding in some sort of elimination stipulation or something like that but again that could very well change the entire match concept right but I enjoyed this war games match and I think a lot of people in my live chat actually enjoyed it as well it was hard hitting and I loved how we got to showcase Jacob Fatu literally coming out of this thing Jacob Fatu Bronson Reed Roman Reigns and CM Punk are on my mind Solo Sokoa really isn't it's mostly Bronson Reed from that tsunami off the top of the cage and uh, Jacob Fatu for how damn good he looked in that match Match. I think Jacob Fatu was the MVP of that entire thing, and he screams future WrestleMania main eventer. I see it. He's money as a heel. Hell, he might be money as a babyface. People love what Jacob Fatu is doing right now, and everything he touches turns to gold, and this match is included. It was well done. He was a beast throughout this entire thing, and I loved watching him go to work. We also had a lot of crazy spots during this thing, but to me, the best part was the storytelling on the OG Bloodlines team. At one point, CM Punk tried to go through the shark cage to enter the ring for the War Games match, and Roman Reigns stopped him, put his hand right out in front of him, and said, Sammy, you go. Then you go back to the cage a little bit later, and it looks like Roman Reigns is going to make his entrance, but then Punk storms right past Roman Reigns and goes down to the ring. Finally, when Roman is in there and he fights off the rest of the old bloodline, or the, I guess not the old bloodline, the new bloodline, one take on, eh? Uh, he fights off the rest of the new bloodline, and then all of a sudden... He is in there with his team down on the ground and he helps up Jimmy Uso. He helps up Sami Zayn. He helps up Jay Uso, but he refuses to help up CM Punk. God, this man might be the pettiest freaking wrestler in the history of wrestling. Roman Reigns needs to get off his high horse. CM Punk was helping him. What are you doing showing this type of pettiness? You put your arm in front of him to begin with and you guys wonder why I don't acknowledge Roman Reigns, huh? You wonder why I don't acknowledge Roman. Because of shit like that, he still is the same man. He hit a low blow during this match. He absolutely does not deserve your acknowledgement. Why do you keep putting your fingers up in the sky?
Okay, I'm going to take a little chill pill right here. But I refuse to acknowledge Roman Reigns, okay? I just simply refuse to acknowledge him, and that is okay, all right? And I, I just, I question your guys' thought process by putting your finger up in the air for this man. He hasn't apologized. But the pettiest man in the world finally made his entrance, and eventually, after CM Punk saves Roman Reigns from a massive tsunami from the top of the cage, through a table, Punk pulls Roman off the table at the last possible second as the table explodes from Jake TV 72, 72 crashing through it. I'll say that one more time, Jake TV 72 crashing through it. And after that, we were on our way to the very end with one of the most satisfying ends in War Games history where Solo Sokoa was left standing all on his own as the rest of the OG Bloodline and CM Punk surrounded him and every single one of them hit their finishing move with Roman and Reigns finishing it off with a spear. It was an incredible finish where we saw the OG bloodline stand tall as Roman Reigns and CM Punk shake hands. Now, obviously, the question is, where do we go from here, right? Where do we move forward with Roman Reigns and CM Punk? Well, they did say in the ring that this was a one time only thing, so don't expect for them to coexist again in the future. But the big story right here coming out of War Games was that CM Punk said to Paul Heyman, you owe me a favor, I'll come and get it when I need it. CM Punk and Paul Heyman might have something cooking in the background. Now, obviously, we can speculate all we want about what this favor could be, and that's why I want to hear from all of you guys down in the comments below. I'm also sure there's going to be a lot of people talking about it in our Hot Takes video, which is going to drop tomorrow, which is Sunday. So if you haven't seen that already, make sure you look for that if you happen to watch this at a later time. But it was a crazy good event, in my opinion. I, I enjoyed both War Games matches a ton. I love the Intercontinental Championship match. I thought the World Heavyweight title match was okay, and I thought that Nakamura and LA Knight was just kind of it, it never really got a chance right it didn't stand a chance being in that second slot in only 10 minutes with a dead crowd it just it stood no chance so I like the show I I'm gonna come in here and say that overall for the night I'm giving it an 8.5 out of 10 now the reason I'm saying 8.5 out of 10 is because I thought that this was above an average show for sure like if I was watching this thing at any given time I think it was entertaining enough to get through the night I think it was hurt by the crowd not being as into some of the stuff as they probably should have been and I think the pacing of the show as well was a little bit off with both war games matches being incredibly long and having some shorter matches in the middle it didn't really get those breakups that we needed that we usually get at a PLE event and as a result I think that that tired out the live crowd as well but overall, once again, all I got to say is Canada, step our game up at Elimination Chamber in 2025. I'm going to be there as well. You're going to be loud for it because we don't want WWE to stop coming to Canada. We have been spoiled this year, and it's been probably one of our worst years for crowds since, like, ever. <laughs> like, the crowds suck this year. So step it up, Canada. We got this. We don't want to lose these events in the future. But thank you very much for watching. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure you hit that like button. Make sure you subscribe to the channel turn on those notifications and keep coming back every single day right here because we upload wrestling videos every single day and one final plug right here if you guys want to see any of my reactions to the full match with the actual match on it check out my patreon we have uploaded all five matches for the night over there for you guys so would love to see you go check that out but thanks again for watching take care and have a good one